Yeah. <laughs> okay. Welcome, everyone. I think we are right on time. Um, there's no one in the online. Should we give a couple of minutes? <laughs> it's but well, you say you know. Um, uh, Daka said it when you said the dates. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's finals week, so yes, everybody in a little bit. But I was thinking. I see. We should join oh, them okay. at least. Do they have their link? Yeah, they should have the link. Carmen sent it today. Hopefully, they didn't think it was. Yeah, two. Carmen forwarded it. Okay. Let me see what. I thought it was at three thirty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some um, one minute pass. I think let's get you start. Get you started, and then they'll find your name. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Um. Welcome. Uh, we have. Luisa Fernanda today from Airship Observatory. And mm -hmm. um, she's a member of the Planetary Radar, Radar Research Group there, uh, where she conducts research about near-Earth asteroids. She also served as a co-chair of Airship Observatory Salvaging Survey Committee after the collapse of the Airship Radio Telescope. How is that going? Um, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> before, um, uh, she worked at the University of Texas at Brownsville at the Center for Gravitational Wave Astronomy. And um, uh, a little bit more background about um, um, education. She, she received her undergraduate degree in applied physics from Metropolitan University in Puerto Rico, a master's in space studies uh, at the International Space University, and conducted research on the use of space technologies for the pre preservation of historical and archaeological sites. Um, thank you for being here today. Um, time is yours. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I guess I'm more relaxed now. <laughs> um, how many of you study asteroids? Okay. You know, you know, so can I do it? Yeah. <laughs> you can too. Okay, no, just to know, to know how to navigate it, uh, the, the presentation. So um, it is a little bit general. Um, this is about the fastest, um, as I don't know if you know, RCO was operating for every 50 years. Out of those 50 years, uh, when it started, it was a, um, a facility to study the ionosphere, not really to study asteroids or anything like that. Everything came after. So in the last 50 years of its operation, we had only to specifically observe objects uh, like asteroids and planets. And what we're doing, what we're seeing, what we're choosing to observe, that's what we're working on, are the fastest of the rotators. So we looked at the objects that we have data for, and so what are the fastest uh, 20 that we find? And um, we found that uh, this cut at a period of about eight minutes, 0.13 hours. So we focused on those and found the ones that also have per, uh, light curve data. Are you familiar with light curve data? Everybody, yes? No. So when object asteroids are not discovered by radar, asteroids are discovered by optical surveys, by shadowing, by um, eclipsing, um, or just by thermal. And once they are discovered, uh, then we can do follow-up observations of these objects with techniques like radar. So the light curve is kind of a measurement of the brightness of the object that it's taken at the moment of you know, discovery or of the moment of observation. So with that information, you can know how the object is um, rotating. You can have an idea of how big it is because there's a relationship between this um, brightness that we call the H magnitude or an absolute magnitude, how bright the object would be if it was at one distance from the sun at one astronomical unit. Um, so we got these two sets of values of rotation period and uh, diameters, ones that the light curve database gave us and says this is from optical data and the ones that we are able to produce with radar data. Now have in mind that for radar data we do have to start with a value from light curves, which is this absolute uh, magnitude. Um, but so after we compare those two, we went and we calculated some basic values for possible cohesion of these objects using the Drucker Crowder cohesion uh, criterion. Very basic, assuming they're spheres, assuming the slope angles are constant, uh, just to get like an initial, what will be, you know, the minimum value that they will need to have. 
Uh, and we also got a, uh, were able to see, set up a relationship between the taxonomical class and the possible, um, both from light curve and from the radar. Here we go. Okay, so the first there's a chat message. There's two chat. Yeah, it's, a, it's okay. It's okay. <clears throat> so if there's no way I can think of it, uh, can I close this one now? I think this has been a thing. Is it a thing? Only? Yeah, I think it's a thing. Unfortunately, okay. So we'll make space for that later. So, but what are fast rotating asteroids, right? This has to, this uh, we define these objects to be the ones that are rotating about two point one to two point four hours. That's like their limit of rotation, and we see that they're usually about three hundred meters in diameter or less. The first one that was discovered was nineteen ninety eight KY twenty six. Uh, this is um image. Uh, this is not an image, this is a synthetic image based on observations from radar made by Steve Ostro, who is one of the pioneers of all of this planetary radar topic. Uh, when he was discovered, they found he was the fastest they had found. He had a rotation period of 10 minutes, 11 minutes. That was something a little bit unexpected back in uh, 1998, which is only a few years ago. So how far away is that object that we can get such a good shape model for. Um, I don't recall how far away it was or, or it is, um, but it was observed many times and we have radar and optical several. But it's epochs. a near Earth object, right? It's a near Earth object, object. yeah. It's a near Earth object. Can, can I ask a very elementary question for my ignorance? Um, you're saying it's, if it is more than 2.1 hours, Rotation according to the fast rotating asteroid. It, yeah, if it rotates less than 2.1 hours, so faster. So where, yeah, so why is the, why do you have the limit of 2.1? I'm going to go to that one next. Are you going to? <laughs> yeah, it's not it's but I miss it. Here's the next slide. So, so, sorry, sorry. So that one had a 10 minute period mm -hmm. and is now still at that 10 minute period. Yes. Okay. It okay. hasn't, we have at changed. least from what I checked in the last publication on online, um, there hasn't been like um, acceleration in the orbit, Yarkovsky okay. or all the other effects on the body. Okay. It's a really good question. We don't know just, that. Just one more thing. <laughs> so on the limit that you mentioned. So on this plot, these are uh, from the Light Curve database, which is a standard repository which everybody is supposed to, we try to have all the light curves that are taken of these objects um, to have them in one place. So from the 2021 release, I got all the objects that were there that had a U parameter. This is kind of the quality parameter and how reliable the data is um, of two or greater. So that ended up giving me about 26,000 entries, which are plotted in the black stars. And then um, we, we you, it's, we see when, when you see this type of plot, you always see if this is the magnitude that can be related to how big it is. There's a relationship to diameter. And this is the rotation period. We usually put it in the logarithmic scale, it's, I think for aesthetics. Um, but you can really see there's an absence of, um, maybe I'm too close. There's an absence on this corner of very fast rotators that are very big, that are very, yeah, that are very big. So. Um, there's something happening around that time and that, that rotation that, you know, it's making these objects not exist in, in the other region. Um, and that is usually because of the critical fear, right? Like how much, how fast is the spin is going to reach a point that is going to, uh, suffer catastrophic disruption because of the size and what it's made of. So I know it's not the corner you study, but it, it does look like it has a, Kind of conical shape, right? Is that is that a thing or okay? But another thing I should write down. So I as um me. as you have longer and longer rotation, no, as you have, or maybe the Long, spines, of the side of the asteroid, sort of. Yeah, there's something happening in the accumulation of the sizes that are about that you have less distribution of sizes for slower, slower rotators. rotators. 
Okay. But I'm looking at the fastest one. But it makes sense because if you think that they are using we use the electrode to deter to determine this the size the rotational period. If you have um, an object with a light size and you don't see changes in this bracket, you cannot determine them. Yeah. So this is an observational Four bias. Feet. Yes. But observations in different epochs can also account for that. Yes, also account. And if you are observing in poly own uh, geometrical configuration, uh -huh, the geometrical configuration. Too, but I think it could be a Even when we have a really high U, U parameter set up, because I, I yeah. We go without the values that could be a higher uncertainty. Does not mean that the observation has a better quality? If you are observing quality for home, uh -huh. you are not seeing any changes. But doesn't mean that the observation is better. And so that could be like a a U parameter. I don't know. But if I go back up to you know shorter rotation period, like say you know ten hours, it seems that there's smaller objects there's a lot more smaller objects retaining than yeah. let's say at a hundred hours do you think that's part of it too Sorry, so yeah. if we're if we're like up here you know because okay there's a shape so i understand for the biggest ones you know mm -hmm. you're not gonna see it rotate slowly this includes mbls mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That just the spread is just so much larger, like right below your line. Okay, just sorry. No, it's okay. Oh wait, I haven't finished it. So um so out of those 26,000 entries, we got this line of you know 10 minutes, eight minutes. Uh and see how many do we have. So we ended up with about 1600 that are the ones plotted above the horizontal line enough. Um and out of those, uh, 222 had that rotation period reported. Uh, sorry, the above the line are of the 2.2 hours, 2.1, 2.4 hours. And the blue ones are uh, 222 that have the rotation period at 10, 8 minutes. Um, and the 29 of them were observed with a receiver, but we're only presenting 20. Because not for all of them we have good enough data that we could, you know, do something with it. And the stars are the ones that we we worked on this paper. So uh similar to the previous data, but just focused on period uh, rotation period intervals. So uh we observe about five percent of the rotators of less than 2.1 hours, uh, but we observe you know 15% of the category of point five hours. We don't really see like a specific preference of so radar can detect better fast rotators and slow rotators or the other way around. It is just what happened by chance that we observed. Um, so radar. Like I was mentioning at the beginning, our CBO was made, was built um, back in the 50s to be uh, study the ionosphere and then slowly became a larger facility. Uh, the design of this telescope is pretty unconventional to what you usually expect for a radio telescope. The dish was a parabolic surface that was not movable. Therefore, your focal point is the one that you needed to move and kind of steer. Uh, that was done by adjusting the cables that you see here and cables that you see here that all connected to the center structure called the platform. Um, by tightening and loosening those cables, you could help uh, get the right um, altitude. And then by moving the round, as you see here, called the dome, along this musical track, you could also leverage uh, many points of focal, uh, focus in the telescope. Um, it did only have about a 30 degree cone of view, so not full sky. But it's still so objects could be tracked for about two hours. One of the reasons why we were able to observe the rings of Saturn, not only because we have a really high transmitter power, but because um, we had that two and a half hour coverage. I think we did that experiment twice. Um, so the way this worked was 
uh, transmit in the Gregorian and the ball that you see there, we have two powerful transmitters. Uh, they're called tristrons. Think of like a particle accelerator or like an electron gun. Uh, these vertical tubes, and they were really good. They had a very high efficiency, 50% efficiency, which is, you know, quite good. Uh, so each one of them had 500 megawatt output. So we, when we had two running, we have one megawatt power. Um, remembering that power dissipates as one to over the fourth power. Uh, sorry, distance to the fourth power. Uh, the more power you have, the better, right? Because you can get further out. Also, the more area you have to collect your echo, the better, because you can get more signals. You can uh, be, um, have more detail. Now, um, unfortunately, like you know, the platform collapsed in 2020, leaving only part of the power structures. But because the power collapsed and you no longer have the S-band radar, which operated at 12.6 centimeter wavelength, uh, we do have tons of data. So even if the structure is not there, our receiver is still there <laughs> because we have tons of data, not only, like I said, in astronomy, planetary sciences, but in astronomy and ionospheric sciences. So why do we care about radar, right? Yeah, it's so interesting. Well, because with radar, it's um, it's an active mode of observation on like uh, passive astronomy. We're actually doing some sort of, an, say it, an experiment. We're sending a beam out, interacting that beam with the surface of the object, and then getting the echo back. What happens in that interaction between the electromagnetic wave, which is a radio wave at 12.3 centimeters, yes, uh, 2380 megahertz, um, we can know things about the object, for example, when we send a continuous wave and we don't alter it, the echo that we get back, since it's unmodulated, is going to give us information about the line of sight velocity, how the object is moving by having a change in the Doppler frequency. We can know exactly the distance, like a very precise, in orders of 10 to the negative 8 in accuracy uh, for our signal data uh, on the range and the distance to us. Um, we, and from use of the bandwidth equation, which is a relationship between this Doppler, uh, this Doppler spread and the diameter of the object and you know, the wavelength you observe it, uh, you can get information about the rotation period. Um, so on the left are some of the items we can measure with radar, and on the right, some of the items we can derive from having radar observation. On the measure one, the ones highlighted in blue, are the ones we actually got for these objects, and the one same for the ones on the right. Note that this is only done for these 20 objects of these fast rotators, but this is also done in for specific objects, right? So when you do a full assessment of radar for a specific object like Phaeton, like our colleague Sean, Sean is doing, or like, um, uh, or there's a lot of them, <laughs> like I was doing for VX12, 2020 VX12, we can create a shape modeling, we can calculate the dielectric surface properties, um, so there is a lot of information we can obtain from radar. We can get companions. We can really know if the object is a binary or a triple system. Um, so like I mentioned, the first set of observations we do is that we transmit the wave, the signal, without modulating it. So it's a continuous, on, on modulated wave that is transmitted in a circular polarization. Yes? If, I'm not making sense, please stop me. <laughs> um, and then, so think of it that you have your, your wave like this, so you're circularly being transmitted. Once you interact with the surface, the helicity of that wave is going to change. And depending on how many times it bounces or scatters with the surface, it's going to change more times. So when we get that signal back, we see it as Maybe. Uh, I didn't know that was in English. I like it. I didn't know that was in English. Okay, so when we receive this, how many PhD students do you need? 
one that's three quarters there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like I said, when we transmit the signal, the, the first echoes we get back are look like this, the top on the the plot on the top. Um, when we're when we are aiming the radar, you know, this is not like a laser that we're shooting and you get right in the bullseye. You know, this has a cone, an angle, um, a cone of observation. And we know the object is going to be somewhere within some uncertainty in, in from that cone. Um, so that uncertainty is accounted for when we're doing the data processing. If we hit it right in the bullseye, say, uh, our, we expect the object to be located at Doppler frequency zero, right? We're according to what we set up and we're gonna receive. This is given by the orbit, so these are uh, the coordinates, which are the ephemerals, which are given by the orbit solution that we are using at that moment for that observation. And this is given to us, or we go and get it from the Horizons, J, uh, JPL system uh, called Horizons. So for 2013 QR2, we transmitted this monochromatic circularly polarized way in the right circular polarization. And then once it hits the object, we get the signal back both in the same sense that it was transmitted, but in the opposite. Now, some correspond to a part of the scattering. We don't know how many times it's scattered, but it corresponds to the interaction with the surface. So the solid line corresponds to the signal that was received in the opposite circular sense. So there's usually the strongest one. Um, and the, the, the dotted line corresponds to the signal that was received in the same polarization that you sent it. Wait, did I say that back here? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the solid line in the opposite signal in the uh, uh, sense and the dotted line in the same uh, circular. So if we get those two signals, say values, uh, we can we can talk a little bit then about the actual scattering that occurred in the surface. So we can talk about the roughness of the surface at the scale of the wavelength we're using. So we're using a 12.6 centimeter wavelength. So every time one of these waves hits with something, you know, say it's with speakers, depends if it sees it or not, but you can get an idea of how many things the size of a speaker or bigger are. We might not be able to know, you know, how many things smaller than there are there, but uh, but we can. So that value of the circular polarization ratio is really important and it's really interesting because uh, there's been studies done uh, by Benner et al. and other folks from uh, the other parts of radar where you can have a relationship between the taxonomical class that we predict by light curve and spectrography and photometry to what could be the taxonomical class based on the circular polarization ratio. Basing it, say, on the principle that you have an E type it should be brighter than if we have uh, C type, S type. So for the non-asteroid people, these are rocks that are either made of like silicate or, or carbonaceous uh, or carbon, carbonaceous chondrite, these types, or, or E type that are enstatites or X types that we really don't know. <laughs> um, so it, it kind of makes a little bit of, of sense, right? Like this, the material that they're made of and the the electrode, the uh, the prop, the electrostatic properties are going to have. So we observe the object, the plot on the top, and we see it's not where we expected it to be. It's not at zero hertz. It's at negative seven fifty. So the address or the ephemeris that we use is off by that much. This corresponds to the line of sight velocity of the object. So how the object is moving with respect to me as I'm observing it, and this correction for this case of 750 hertz corresponds to a line of sight velocity correction of 47 meters per second. This thing is traveling at 25 kilometers a second. And we can tell you with a precision of four kilometers per hour, we can tell you a precision of meters per second. The change in velocity, to me, that's one of the most mind-blowing things about radar. Because it's the same case for distance. We can we objects that are millions of kilom of mile kilometers is correct to say <laughs> away. We can with meters accuracy. It's that's to me that's just like wow. So we we find the the difference the seven hundred and fifty hertz, and then we go into this system that I told you about assault um horizons. We do we submit the information, and then with that new correction, 
the system gives me a new ephemeris, a new address, a new coordinate system over the object is going to be. And then we, we ping or we blast or go <laughs> experiment on the object again uh, to confirm, confirming that we actually have the address right and we have it on the moon side. So it is at zero frequency. So then we have this on the first set of observation or the first uh, thing we do when we observe, we located the object in Doppler. We know how fast it's going. We know if it was an offset or not from the original ephemeris. So we can know if it was going a bit faster or if it was going a little bit slower, that those type of, of corrections. And like I mentioned, there was a relationship between the taxonomical class and the circular polarization ratio as was studied by Benner. So we got all the circular polarization ratios of these objects. Basically, the, like I said, the ratio between the solid line and the dotted line, how much came in the same sense and in the opposite sense that we translated it. And uh, they're listed by year of, of discovery of uh, on the horizontal axis. Uh, in, we see a couple of things, but we can make a lot of extrapolations from them. For example, there's an absence of uh, E, uh, V, X, V types, maybe, saying like, 2015 backwards. That could be the telescope instruments that we had back then. That could have been just, they weren't as discovered with optical, so we couldn't know about them and be given to us to observe different things. Um, but we do see that there's kind of like an absence in general of this, of G, M, F, uh, but those, sorry, no. Yeah, we see kind of like an absence right there in the middle. And they mostly stay on the silicates, carbonaceous, mine types like on the bottom with the ones with very low uh, circular polarization. A circular polarization ratio of one is pretty much a very highly reflective area. Uh, and if you have one of zero, the smaller it has, is the less reflective it is, the less rough you can say on the circle. So this is one of uh, this is under review right now for Icarus. And one of the reviewers comments was to, on this plot specifically, uh, maybe talk a little bit more about the errors that we have here. And the errors that are come with the measurement of the circular polarization ratio are, what, are, are varied. It comes from the platform tilt height and angle, the temperature of the system when we're receiving. We had some temperature problems sometimes that uh, are important to, to account for. So, uh, so we traditionally just give like a uniform value, like for this data set, it all has a 20% error or a 10% error. Uh, so kind of, I will need, I will want to go more into that detail of how it is. Um, so just error. remind me, when mu c goes close to one, you have the same circular polarization, right? Yes, yes, exactly. And I will show you an example of a plot uh, that has that. Um, so we were the idea is to compare diameters and rotation periods to start with. So we um, we talked of the circular polarization ratio as a plus uh, to do the taxonomy, and because we had it, but let's talk about the rotation period. So the red dots are the let's call it light curve database period, pretty much the one we obtained from their web page. Uh, the diamond uh, is using that given diameter from the light curve people and fitting it to a measurement of bandwidth, okay? That gives me a different period on the green diamond. And then the blue X is the radar, um, the radar period we obtained by taking the light curve absolute magnitude and putting it at a specific optical albedo. This optical albedo is going to be dependent on what was our perceived, our, our I guess, taxonomic or class from this. Yeah. yeah. So from here, we can say that this object seems to be, uh, this seems to be an S or C type. So I can calculate the diameter using an optical albedo that it's close to. 0 0.25, 0 0.28, because that's what typically an S type will have. So we did that at uh, different age. Now, for the ones that are brighter, right? Everybody above, say, this line, instead of using an albedo of 0.3, we use an albedo of 0.6. 
which is more representative of objects that are uh, on the E, on the XB uh, parts. Uh, and that calculation gives us the, the, blue, the blue cross. So the red is the light curve period given by the light curve database. Uh, that we obtained from there. The radar period is the one where we got that one that was given to us and we fit it to the radar bandwidth. And then the third one is the one where we changed the absolute the, um, the albedo and fit the radar data to it, the radar bandwidth. We see that most of them agree, but there's some that don't, which goes to what we were talking about, what um I forgot your name. Chiara. To what Chiara was mentioning. Caroline. Caroline. Yeah. Like Caroline. Okay. French. Brazilian. Oh. Yeah. So not all of them agree, and it goes to what, what Carol was mentioning, the um, viewing geometry, right? So the apparent rotation period that we get from the from the bandwidth, it can appear to be slower, but never faster. Uh, so it really gives us a, uh, a limit on the rotation period. Light curve, on the other hand, can uh, cannot sample fast enough these objects, right? So it might not we get the we get to get the true period. So why do uh, I sound like that I have a limit? Oh, so <laughs> this one, yes. So Turini got a. Why is this one awesome? I don't know, because it matched what the guy said. So my point on the on the thing is like. Like our thirty six, where our light curve period matched what Irene uh, said, uh, which was a little bit off, but still uh, pretty close. Uh, now these are very disparate. For the eighteen LK, uh, for uh, that object to have the diameter of the light curve database, it has to be rotating really, 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 really slow, like a couple hundred hours. So that tells us that there was some observing circumstance for which we were um, looking at it like that. To where the next part of radar observations comes in, where it's really interesting, because we talked about non-modulating the, the signal, right? We just send the signal. Now we're gonna embed something in the signal, like when you're doing your car in your radio station, right? You have the music embedded in the signal that you're getting, but we don't put music in, okay? We just put code. You know, we put codes of different lengths, and the code changes the sampling that is doing every X time that we tell it. We can tell it to do every 0.5 microseconds. We can tell it to do every 0.2 microseconds. And depending on how fast that sampling is changing, is that we can get better, uh, say, resolution, or like we can see more in, from the signal. And I want to show you here, these are some raw products, okay? Not like in the paper, but behind the scenes <laughs> um, images. So we we were mentioning, I mean, she was asking about, you know, our, like our, our high circular polarization, like if it has the same as one. We get those cases sometime, like in this one, it's pretty high, the SC and OC, but we also have some that is just garbage. Like we know that this is really not physically possible. So maybe for this object, we can get information about, yes, the bandwidth, like how our fast is rotating. And on range, you know, line of sight velocity and line of sight distance. But maybe the circular polarization measurement we get from this is not useful. So in cases like this, we discarded that value uh, and not, not use the circular polarization. What I want to show here is that after we do the continuous wave, we do something called uh, range, which is this modulation, but at an interval, the, the, the biggest one, four microseconds. And what we usually get is like a code of like a thousand rows, and somewhere in there is the object, right? And after doing a lot of magic and fancy codes, we can find it. We can find something as big as that pixel. We can tell you where that pixel is mm -hmm. with a lot of precision. Nobody knows that pixel better than we do, okay? Um, but then we can also, um, and objects can have, you know, a very narrow bandwidth and not be so bright. So maybe you smooth the signal a little bit. Uh, but is, um, but then, then we can have other objects that are very, very bright that as soon as you see them, you know, you see a spot. Here, 
Uh, I don't show any because none of the fast rotators are binaries. Good question. Why no fast rotators are binaries? Um, but we would see if it was a binary, we would see like the secondary really bright and then the binary kind with a broader bandwidth. So this is LK18, which we saw was one of the objects highlighted before. And this is same object in U4. So each, this pixel in this image is 300 meters uh, in height and like a couple of hertz in width. So how big each pixel is depends on that shift in, that change of the code that I mentioned earlier. Uh, if we look at the one up here, this is one of a better resolution. This is like 7.5 meters per pixel. Uh, and what I wanted to do, this is a GIF that you'll see later moving. It's rotating really fast. But we went ahead and tried to split them. These are some sub six, I believe, um, where you can see the object you know, we don't see any drifting up and down, but we definitely see change of change in brightness. This type of data is really good for shape modeling because you can get, you know, we're gonna see it from different viewing geometries, you know, different viewing angles, but they're rotating so fast that your signal is pretty smeared. You can't really make surfaces, uh, I mean, car surface characteristics like we did with Phaeton, with Phaeton, which is the, Target of the Destiny Plus mission is from the Japanese Space Agency, kind of like Hayabusa, but I'm sorry, kind of Osiris Rex, but from the Japanese. Um, you can see a perturbation in it, like a, a crater, or or even on Bennu, that even before Osiris Rex was sent, you could see there was something sticking out of it. But the system didn't, could be both, it could be sticking out or it could be in at the same time. Very shoddy. Um, so just for people who are not astronauts, it ended up being a big boulder. Huh? It ended up being a big boulder. It ended boulder. up being a big boulder. Yes. Yes. That's not a concavity. So here, um, let me show you. This one, I'm moving. Why are they the other ones? Okay. So here are um, the X, X, Y, A that I showed in the previous slide. This image is a sum of 87 scans. Uh, each pixel is 7.5 meters in delay. It increases from the top to the bottom and 1.5 hertz in Doppler, which increases to the right. Uh, you sent your waves 87 times at this object. Those are 87 eight. send receive cycles. Okay. So you sent and received 87, 87 sets. Okay. Oh, and okay. every time you had to like adjust where exactly you're looking because you think it's moving in space, right? Yeah. The ephemeris predicted does that for you. And so with the telescope, you tell it now the ephemeris and then it like... Mm -hmm. It tracked. Okay. It, it, it uh, went tracking for two hours or depends if the power went out, if something happens. So the 87 scans on an object, is that like good or is that standard? Is good, yeah. For in, but on fast rotators, it's far more common. Okay. Because they're going so fast. You have to. Uh, and also, it depends on the distance, right? Because it's the round trip time that is going to delimit how many scans we can get in the two hours, two and a half hour window that you have uh, to track the object. Now, most of these subjects didn't take more than 20, 30 minutes to observe. So. What happens after two and a half hours? The telescope is not able to pursue it no more? Yeah, it goes out of the horizon, I of see. our visible horizon. And so then next night, you could look at it again. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Now with the NGAT, <laughs> we can have <laughs> Or with a pure antenna. Um, but one of the other things, uh, the other thing I wanted to show by comparing these two is that, um, so this is 2013 QR1. Uh, these are nine scans at 7.5 meters per pixel in delay, also from top to bottom, and five hertz uh, in width. So we literally count pixels sometimes, okay? Because we know how big each pixel is. So with that, I can, when I zoom in in, in the actual raw image, I can say, well, the visible extent can go kind of up to here. So let's assume it's a sphere which could and could not be. Uh, so we can get kind of like a visible extent possible base diameter. 
uh, same here, right? Now, this data, we can change how they are uh, compressed or stretched in delay, uh, in, in Doppler, sorry, in, in Doppler. So, depends on how we spread or, or compress that data, depending how many Fourier transfers you do to, to the, the data set, we can, we can kind of artificially make it more of a shape, but it's artificial. This is not a picture of the object. This so is that just would be my question. So why are you, are you just counting pixels, assuming that it's a sphere, knowing that this is not a shape? Just to get a minimum idea. At some point, this object has to be at least that size. I see. Okay. To begin. But um, uh, and is this is Doppler, right? So, so the yes. higher Doppler, the faster it's moving. So you're seeing that you have portions of it that are moving fast, and other. So basically, you're seeing the equator over here and the poles over there, right? Depends on the viewing geometry, but yes, you can presume that. No, well, because on your graph, you says Doppler is this way. So I'm just assuming the equator is rotating faster. So that's going to give you pixels who are higher in Doppler, right? Yes. Okay. Because you're not seeing an image. Okay. Literally. Okay, I guess you're saying, okay. But even if you have another viewing geometry, your equator is still being moving faster, you no? Know? Oh no, I guess if you want if to you're look like at really so long. Okay. Uh-huh. If it's if it's like tumblers. Yes. That was another reviewer uh -huh. comments. Check okay. these three that could be tumblers. Mm -hmm. So you can see their yeah, so. and delay is the distance. Delay the distance. Yeah. So so if you get it approximately at the same. We the center them when we do when uh -huh. we do this image. Like uh -huh. when we find them. It might not be, oh, you can see it here. So when we find it, this pixel was not necessarily right in the middle. It was probably like up here. So uh, another thing I want to show with this image is the background noise that you see. Um, it's very noisy really, when you compare uh, the one on the left and the one on the right. Uh, and you know, that is due by a multitude of things. Uh, but we're the colleagues at, at, at APL that were at USRA before as well. They've been working on some codes to kind of help neutralize that background noise and get better noise statistics. Uh, so in optical astronomy, which is how I started my astronomy career, we used to take these things called sky flats uh, and dome flats where we basically try to have a perfectly illuminated surface and know what you're reducing. So they're doing something that I understand is similar to this uh, so that we can get a more definition of where the signal really is, like where are the ends of the signal. But wouldn't you have to use the RSC with telescope to do that? No, it's on the data that we already have. Oh, I see. Like reprocessing. So what's the noise there then? Is it like, is the sunstorm going on or something? Um, in this one specifically? Are people on their phones? No. Thermal noise. There, I was going to say temperature related. The hardware? Temperature yeah. related cables. Okay. Receiver sensor. Receiver temperature. Okay. We did have for some time like a big problem on receiver temperature. But it's too hot. So. That was too hot. Yeah. That was too hot. Um, so this is the example I was going to show where we had a circle vaporization that was pretty high, where the SC and the OC are pretty close. Um, so this is 2017 EK, which is the still from the previous image. But see, when we're seeing here, it's rotating so fast. Uh, this has a sum of six scans, in, six scans in each frame and the 61 scans. Um, this object was rotating, I know, I was gonna forget, that's why I wrote it in that. This object was rotating in minutes, 30 seconds. Um, how big is it? Mm -hmm. uh, I know that too. Well, we can have this. Um, 
diameter. 43 me, it could be somewhere between 50, wait, sorry, diameter. Like 43 to 30 meters, 30, 40 meters. It's a spin. Huh? It's like, a, you know, the spin. Top. Yeah, <laughs> spin top, yeah. Well, we, we don't know exactly, and we don't know which direction we're looking at. We're looking at the spin top one like this, like this. Because to me, it looks like it's going along this axis, but that's not necessarily the case. It could be going like this, and it's but a 30 you're second not rotation. Seeing, and you're not seeing an image, right? Yes. No. So you're just seeing echo. So I can't, you, yes. your brain shouldn't make that. Okay. But it does. And this again is where uh, having more data is always good, having light curves. So we can, uh, mm -hmm. good light curves. So we can also work on, on doing uh, shape models. Okay. Uh, so FRAs are very difficult because they rotate so fast <laughs> and you can't just like stop them uh, completely. Also, if you do just like one scan at a time, you don't necessarily get enough uh, uh, data for it. Uh, I think the round, let me say the round trip time there. So taking into account this correction we did in line of sight velocity at the beginning and line of sight distance with what we just showed, uh, you know, because we know exactly how far uh, those objects are in, in delay. Um, we added this part of astrom astrometry, pretty much showing how much radar can help improve the astrometry the astrometry uh, data of these objects. So for the thir there's 20 objects, uh, 13 of them were discovery apparition, and six of them were multi-apparition. And we have one of them that it wasn't really affected. But for the 13 discovery operation cases, the astrometry from radar improved the next encounter window by 300, our knowledge of it, by 324 years. And for the six multi operation by 24.2 years, which is pretty important to know where these bugs are and when are they coming back. 69% of the subjects would have been lost if it hadn't been for Arecibo data meaning they would have been lost when we're trying to see when is the next time they're going to pass within 1.1 AU. So how they don't have that. <laughs> Those are important. Um, and then the position uncertainties were also um, reduced incredibly, like 84% on average for, this, for the discovery operations and 35% just on average as a, as a whole. So... You know, when was there ever an instance where you had an uncertainty, like sort of, you know, as it spreads the uncertainty along the orbit or the trajectory of some object where Earth was within the cone and then Arecibo put it out of the cone? Yes. Do you have examples like that? Don't remember off the top of my head, but we can, I can get you that because one of the group members did an abstract or we looked into that um, a little bit specifically on like objects we were taking off the sentry list. Mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, these objects were in sentry, the radar data helped and put off the cone. So, yeah. Uh, 2020 NK1 was a good example of that. The last one we observed. Uh -huh. 2020 NK1, yes. Thanks, Sean. Thank you for being here now. You should have told me you're here. Well, I don't know. Okay, it's my backup. Um, so we got the value for diameter. We have values for rotation period. You know, we compare possible taxonomical classes and assume that some of them might agree. So then we use what I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, we try to calculate a pretty basic rudimentary value for cohesion using the Drucker Private Cohesion Criterion, which basically takes uh, the stressors that the object will have. Uh, we are assuming again, like it's a, it's a sphere, so it's a very simple case. Um, and we we did it following the work of Paul Sapple and Polly Schuch, who did it for other two asteroids, uh, replicating it, making sure we got you know the same one with our code that they did for their asteroids. Uh, and we found that most of the asteroids are pretty much under a couple on a couple hundred pascals. They don't need much cohesion to keep each other together. So in the Drucker Prager, you have internal friction too, right? Mm -hmm. So did you look at that also or just? We put in constants too. 
you put internal cohesion as a constant. Like it was 35. Okay. We actually did it in increments from 30 so to you 25. You couldn't run it with two um, unknowns. You couldn't run it with two unknowns. No. We ran it with just K unknown. Okay. And everything else we assume. Why is that? Okay. Is everything else, what else was there you assumed? Uh, axial ratios, which is based on shape. Uh -huh. Um. Um, so you had to assume that you couldn't get that from the data. No, not for all of them. For EK, we could maybe do that because we have more of like an idea of the shape. Uh, maybe for X, Y, eight too, because it looks maybe a little pointy. But for the rest, no. Mm -hmm. Okay. And these two that you knew the actual ratio for, these actual ratios were like different or similar. Different because they were more ellipse. We weren't assuming okay. they were uh, uh, a so sphere between them. them. Um, like between them. Like, oh, um, because I'm thinking if they if they rotate so fast, they have similar cohesions and same assumed internal friction, you would end up with the same shape, no? Would you not? If they're not made of the same. But if you have same cohesion and internal friction, that dictates your end shape, does it not? You know, just like when you calculate, you know, hydrostatic equilibrium mm -hmm. with some of these, the internal force is what sort of dictates you. Do you guys do that sometimes? No problem. No problem. <laughs> I'm just wondering, you know, like like some of these Jewett and um papers that you're mentioning, like, I think that you need just these things to create a shape with a certain rotation speed, I thought. I don't know. Just, I guess my effort would be in this thought process to try to reduce the unknown on the axial to see if, you know, I look at it some sort of shape. Yeah. 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 If you could run it, it's just because if two, with two unknowns, you could still make plots, you know, like where would you be if you had a 35 degree? Uh -huh. uh, and where would you be if you had a 40 degree? Uh -huh. Yeah. Like one, um, two, three, 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 three. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So you, you could still show, you know, basically the parameter space of the strength, what your asteroid would be doing, in the, what it could look like. So. Just, just share. No, no, <laughs> share, share away. And I'm, and I'm thinking here about okay. it dictating the shape. Uh, because, I mean, the rotation at the end is really what is going to help the material stay or, or go. And the position as Roger Prager, uh, as this examples that we're, we're using. Also talk a little bit about, you know, the electrostatic uh, forces keeping them together, mm -hmm. how that could be another approach. So something that could even could be even better is like try to do a different model that is not as basic as the draft fragger, where we we can't tell the shape for everybody. We can only tell the shape probably for four or five of them. And yes, if you're gonna do, if I'm gonna do just we if we are gonna do just you know rotation period and diameter, uh, might as well do it for. 1400 objects in the light curve database if you're not varying any other more tailored uh, parameters. Uh, but yes, I like, I think I, I mean, honestly, I do think that the strength is the, the thing that dictated more than any electrostatic forces, like at the scale of like a 50 meter object, you know, I would think that it would be able to neutralize, it, like equalize itself in some way. You see what I'm saying? Uh -huh. Yeah, like um, a 15 meter object rotating in yeah. 30 seconds. Although I don't know, you know, what it, the solar wind interaction does at these speeds, but um if we get they get accelerated. Yeah. And that's something you, I, you know, it's just when you say 35 degrees internal friction, you're basically picking I'm picking a yes, a theme, you know. Yeah, I'm just, yeah. No, and the yeah. calculation of the tensor angles of each one of them were based yeah. on that. Uh, it's, it's a very general uh, assumption. And um, have you ever tried to pick another one and see what it does to your numbers? 
Uh, we did, and the and those were the lowest. We ran it at density intervals between one and three grams mm -hmm. per cubic centimeter, intervals of 0.5. Uh, also varying the the slow parameter and and the internal um that we were just talking about mm -hmm. and I guess we, yeah those were the three things we played a little bit with and since we wanted to find the minimum value like the bottom mm -hmm. part of the possibilities of the the I minimum see. of the highest the highest minimum uh we chose densities of one gram per cubic centimeter. But then we look back again at the data and see, for example, Benu and see Rigu and see what they have for their uh, um, cohesions and densities. You know, it is not far fetched that is 1.5 grams per cubic centimeter, uh, more so than three grams per cubic centimeter. Mm -hmm. So, yes, there is. I have like four things that I wish I had written as we told That's why I don't know. And then and then so you vary these things and then you pick the lowest cohesion values you were getting. Mm -hmm. And these you were getting for 35 degrees yep. internal cohesion. Mm -hmm. If you had 40 degrees, you would require higher cohesion yes. to stay together. Yes. Do you remember? Like because so here you see a lot of them are in the couple of hundred pascals. Do you remember how much higher? Not at the level of the ten thousands. Okay. If they didn't go up at the ten thousands, like level. they would like be a factor two or a thousand twenty five hundred. Yeah. We can I can we can look at it after the this to refresh so my like memory. An order of magnitude though. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. But not at, at the huge difference as we see in this board. Mm -hmm. The axis is missing something. Like it's missing some patches. Okay. I just noticed that. <laughs> uh, well, maybe it's when I shrunk it. So most of them have a condition of a few hundred pascals. Um, oh, like I said, yeah, we did one to three centimeters. We have some here. But then there were a few cases where it really sticks out, like EK, GS2. And now that's not there that you see it, where they needed a cohesion of like 10, like almost 10,000 pascals. Uh, that's a lot because for what we expect, uh, most of these objects uh, have just a few hundred pascals. So, just a few conclusions. Uh, we did this to kind of try and get an independent measure confirmation of the values of the rotation period and the diameter. Uh, because neither one of these uh, observations is completely reliable. Neither one of these methods is completely, you know, foolproof. Mm -hmm. observations can be difficult, like I mentioned, if the sampling rate is not fast, is not fat, fast enough. Um, and for radar, you know, the viewing geometry uncertainties like we were seeing, are we looking at it full on, full to the side? So we will need to know more about the, the sub-radar latitude at which we're uh, thinking the object that um um that can give value. So 2017 EK was the object that we found like the minimum value for coefficient before breaking apart would be like 10,000 uh pascals, which is pretty big, like I've said a couple times. Like sandstone has a porosity of 30% and an internal strength of 100 pascals. I mean these objects could have some sort of um sand or, or the uh, regolith that is more coarse. Um, we also found that a large fraction of these were consistent with being E types. But like I mentioned, you know, maybe we didn't see as many E types before because they just weren't discovered. So they just didn't give it to RSEO to observe. And although we are only presenting 20 objects here, uh, we feel that there shows at least three cases where these objects require non serious strength to. To keeping them together that are what we know representative of a hundred meter uh, NES. So some questions to ponder that we're still pondering on uh, are all these FRAs where we can name to be monoliths, meaning you know uniformly com uniform composition. Maybe um, some of them, you know, maybe these FRAs are end of life objects where they lost all their surface. And since they were rotating so fast, they just kept losing treading material. And now what you have is kind of more of what it was the, the parental body. 
uh, because the separate spinals, most of them uh, seem to be collision by products. That's how they stay like uh, spin up also because of the sun. But if they lose all their material, how much would they heat and accelerate their rotation? Uh, do we have a good count of what percentage of PHAs potentially hazardous asteroids for the humans? Uh, these are not objects that are going to come and hit the Earth. Those are called virtual impactors. <laughs> but the PHAs are objects that are larger than 140 meters and can come within 19 lunar distances of Earth. It's pretty far, uh, but it's kind of like a, like a baseline measurement uh, for now that could change. Uh, as more data we have. But how many of these potentially hazardous asteroids are fast rotating asteroids? And are these uh, FRAs, if we assume these say monolithic nature that they're pretty much uniformly composed, will this be easier to deflect if we were needed to have a deflection technique? So why, um, if the if the creature requires just 100 pascals for most of them, why are you even bringing up the monoliths you know, because you would get low cohesions, you would get easily from a dirt pile, right? So, so the monoliths come from the like three that were off the chart. Okay. And Shears and Sanchez, uh, David Shears and yeah, yeah, Cole Sanchez. They have like two papers with a person from the from Asia, maybe several papers, where they talk about this. Here by Ashen. Here by yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, they talk about this, and then they do talk more about like the electrostatic part of it. How much would that have to be? And that was a little bit uh, advanced for me, but I will go back into it. I just learned yeah, that. I but my my topic of mentioning like the monoliths for the ones say that are shredding their material. Uh, it is what I kind of like see, like they're going so fast, they're shredding everything, you end up with less material over time. If one of those is gonna come towards Earth, would we be able to deflect it differently? Like would it need a different deflection? How different would it be? But if we were shedding over time, so like would you see would you expect to see maybe some of this to be active? Like right. Okay. But that has not been observed yet, right? Bobeno was observed to be active and we in the sense, yes. And the dimorphos, dimorphos is super active right now. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <what okay. laughs> Yes. So so um actually question, sorry if it's a bit off topic, but so you're concentrating on fast rotators, but did you apply some of these techniques to Venu, for example, where now we know everything about? No, I not yet. Okay. But there are on the references, there's two papers that talk about the cohesion of Venu, forecasted and then measured. Uh, and that is one of the reviewers' comments too, to talk about this cohesion as a function of depth, of surface depth, mm -hmm. which is something that I don't, I didn't touch on before. Um, yeah. But we, and you don't have the data and where did that? That's what the other thing. So, maybe. Yeah. People are being used to the So, so yes, what do you say? Like you know, how we you know, say they're monoliths if they're clearly four hundred pascals, like they're they're not that solid. Yeah, rocks. Uh, they don't but, need to be. I mean, maybe they are, but they don't need to. They be. don't need to. Yes. Be. But okay, we're learning more about these rocks all the time. They're mm -hmm. surprising. Because a monolith would have a what is it a ninety degree internal friction? What is it? Or it's zero. Anyways, you know, a monolith the internal friction is like infinite. So, well, we're using the board monolith in a very loose way. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Very loose. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not like literally a undifferentiated piece of rock, molten walls, but more uniform structure, uniform material but composition. A rock, but a piece of rock. Or an aggregate of rocks that are very similar. Okay. Yeah, that would be a monolith too. Kind of like a tour lift. Ah, and it sounds like a menu. <laughs> a menu. <laughs> Anyways, okay, I'm stopping. Um, I had another question. Wait. Uh, we feel for the well, maybe just change our monoliths to our FRAs easier to redirect or not. Well, anything that has these low cohesion values, I think, might be a little concerning. 
if it's coming really close, really fast. And I'm keen on this topic because I just got back from the planetary defense conference. You know, and just seeing that it's concerning. Um, but could there be other like region? Oh yeah, that's another question. Could there be other like boundaries or region where of, of cohesion where we can have a combination of objects that rotate faster? but have a different taxonomy than we expected. So like as S type rotating, you know, as fast and being bigger. Like kind of doing that part. I don't do simulations yet, but maybe that would be a project for future to do more simulations. Uh, and yeah, like I mentioned before, like maybe are these FRAs end of life objects that were just going around and broke off or then got accelerated or got hit or suffered from your or Jarkovsky effect uh, in our shredding material or are they? You yeah. wouldn't see that on your radar data, right? If they were active, would you see that? We would have to have a really big coma to see it. A really big what? Uh, oh. Outburst or discharge of, uh -huh. of particles. They're very dense, not mm -hmm. big, but dense. So in optical, you would see it. It also has to be dense. Like with the LBT, the, the large binocular telescope, probably if it's not too far, too faint of an object. And it, I was going to say, mm -hmm. uh -huh, and, and Howard, or James W. And the Neo, Neo Wise, Neo mm -hmm. Surveyor. Yeah. It's infrared, that wouldn't know. I mean, they did some the ones color. with the spitzer, so it was, there's probably some difference in the color of the nucleus and the coma that can be detected. Yeah, because the, the, the coma shredding here is not by heat, it's by the disruption of, of momentum of, of the object. The disruption on a comet is purely thermal, so you could see it better in like infrared, no? No, because what you see usually is the dust. You know, so you have the jet, uh -huh. you know, these are so cold temperatures. Uh, you have the jet of whatever volatiles and they take the dust with them. And from Earth, usually you just see the dust. Right. You but that, yes, but right. the process is different. The process of yes. a comet expelling and uh, yeah. sometimes <laughs> an active asteroid. Yeah. Oh, sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yes. You can see it. Yes. But yes, just okay. Thanks. Sorry. But that was it. Okay. Okay, Did very good. Finish? Oh, sorry. I yeah, you. to finish. This is the group uh, that was at our single. I wasn't there for the picture, so I show it all the time. Uh, um, this is right after Hurricane Maria, and you know, these 131 people uh, helped immensely the community of Puerto Rico after that hurricane, distributing water, just you know, lending a hand, cleaning the roads. So most of them are no longer there. Uh, but I always like to uh, put this slide up. Now, now it's here. <laughs> yeah, we have Okay, uh, I think we got a lot of questions on the on the way. But um, if you have any questions, please raise your hand or unmute yourself online. Do you have questions on this? Uh, no, I'm I'm just asking if anyone has questions. Oh, I yeah. No, I can't. It's uh, four thirty. Did I go or climb a lot? No. Mm -hmm. Too much. Eight minutes past. Yeah. No. I did it. I did it fast. It was no, eight, eight minutes past now. Oh, but because of the conversation. No, it was my yeah, it, but, yeah, it was because of the conversation. Let me write down like you said four things that. Okay. Um, there's a hand raised by Sean. Yeah, go ahead, please. Oh uh, yeah, just mentioning, I sent a link for the chapter with an animation of radar images. I find staring at that is helpful for developing some intuition for how the like plane of sky view projects to radar. So yeah, uh, click the first link for the animation, the GIF. Anyway, well, uh, enjoy. Uh, Not my work, but this is nice. Uh, uh, doesn't have the axis, but on this one. It's a follow. Exactly. So to the right is how we would be seeing it if we were able to see it with our eyes. That would be mm -hmm. this one. I see. And this is the radar. Yeah. The right one. Yeah. Where you see that echo that you were mentioning, like the yeah. sorry, the equator. 
Yeah, but it's it's that it's like how fast it's going on the x axis and how far it is on the y axis. Slower. Why do we always see the secondary even if it is passing in front of the primary? One day or behind that. You know the secondary? Yeah, there is even if it comes up or down, you always see. Uh that is probably how they not going to you see, but but the see it disappears yeah, it because be. now it's in the back. It's in the back when it's at the bottom. How can it be in the upper when it's at the bottom? Because what you're seeing is not the image of the thing. It's you're seeing the speed at which it goes and the distance at which it's at. Okay. So at this moment it's going at the same speed and okay. one of and they're at the same distance. And but now it disappears not. behind the object. And now it comes You're not seeing an image of the thing. It's, it's always the mind bending thing about <laughs> radar images. Exactly. Yes. Mind bend. I like that word. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. It's okay. okay. Yeah. Thank you, Shannon. It was cool. Um. Any more questions here? <laughs> Go on. Yeah, I have, have, have um very general questions. So what is the life cycle of these things? Are they are there new asteroids forming or are they dying at the rate certain rate? What's the evolution of this? Oh, asteroids. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, that's not a very heavy question. Well, well, I, I mean, DACA is, is so, being worked on a lot in several fields of asteroid studies. I would say I don't want to answer any questions. Go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. Wow, the lifestyle of this subject. I, I don't know the answer. But but, to that, but, but my me? understanding is studying rotation of these objects is trying to answer that question. Oh, okay. If you study statistical populations and how they rotate and their size. Uh, what's her name? She's doing that in Europe. Um, Kukunetova. She has good papers on trying to figure out what the life story of an asteroid is. Oh, okay. You know, but they they take into account that they get smaller and smaller, mm -hmm. and then they rotate faster, less fast, because you know they accelerate, then they break up, then they accelerate again. So there's like yeah. It's a whole body of research. Okay, I, I, I think, I think yeah. Let's keep that question open and then <laughs> finish it for today. I think. Okay, thank you again. You have to. You can have to see. Uh...